27. The book of Ephesians is a church <coughs> book. Ecclesia Biblius. It is a church book. It talks about the church so much. And here tonight in this verse we talk about it again. We talked about um, uh, the fathers, their responsibility. We're not going to get out of that, are we? As fathers, we're the head of the home. It is our responsibility to lead our, our family in everything, especially in the spiritual things of life. It talked about the woman submitting herself to her husband as if he was the Lord. That's pretty hard to swallow for some women, but that's what it says. Submit yourself to the to your husbands as if he was the Lord, just like you're submitting yourself to God. Submit. Submit, that means stand under, to bow your head. Abraham's wife, Sarah, called him what? Adonai, Lord. Why did she do that? In respect, because he was her Lord. But a child in this world, we're going to get to children, but a child, children are the most important things that we ever bring into this world. And we have such a tremendous responsibility to God when we bring them here. We bring them here, we bring them into the world, and we need to nourish them with the Word of God. It's very important. It is our responsibility. I don't care whether you're mother or father or whatever you are, yeah, you, your, your responsibility is to let God, to let the child see God through you. To let the child see God through you. Because when a child is growing up, many times they'll think of God as they would their parents. Now I'm gonna tell you, that's, that's exactly the way it is. I love to teach children. I've taught children a lot of my life. One of the most enjoyable times that I've ever had is pre teaching preschool and kindergarten and the first and second and third grade children. I was the junior pastor at, at two different churches. And I tell you what, I had those little kids. They were doing some very deep things. <laughs> I would, they, they are very able to learn. Their minds are alive and active. And you'd be surprised what you can teach your child. When I was teaching when Dakota was very young, I was uh, for a whole year at, at uh, Conley School in Taft, I was a, sub, I was a uh, teacher's helper. And I just loved it because those children looked up to you just like you were God. You were just filling them with all kinds of exciting things. You, you were teaching them how to read. You were teaching them how to write. Teaching them how to paint. And all this is brand new. And every time I, I think about that, it is, you're, you're teaching them how to respect God. How, how your whole avenue of thought about God. Well, let's go into 5 and 27. Hina, Ares Tese, Autos, He Auto, Indoxon, Tain, Ecclesion, Me, Exuson, Spilon, A, Ritida, A, T, Ton, Toy Uton, Toy Uton, All, Hina, A, Hagia, Kai, Am, Amomos. This is a beautiful verse. It's talking about Christ and his bride. Christ and his bride. Now, you have to go back to verse 26. It, talking about the Lord sanctifying his bride as a man should sanctify his bride in order that her he might sanctify having cleansed her in the washing of the water in the word. 
All right? Now, Paul is using the analogy of Christ and his church and a man and his wife. A man is supposed to love his wife like Christ loves church. Christ gave himself for it. <clears throat> now, the, the church is a very mysterious, it's a mysterious to the world. The world gets the idea that the church is the family of God. But I'm going to tell you something, right? Here and in many places, it makes a strong distinction. Nobody that hasn't been baptized will ever be in the ecclesia. Did you know that? Now, just think about that for a little while. Nobody that has, is without baptism will ever be in the ecclesia, the, the church. But you can be in the family of God. You can be saved without being baptized. But you cannot be in this ecclesia without being baptized. Now there's the difference between the Bible's idea of the local, visible New Testament church and Protestantism and the Catholic idea of the universal, invisible church. And these are the things that really make the difference. The church the Lord, in Matthew 16 and 18 and 28, 18 through 20, Jesus was talking to Peter and the assembly. He looked at Peter and he said, you're a little stone, you're a petros. But upon this gigantic found, foundational stone, gigantic stone, Petra, I shall be building my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not destroy her, shall not wrestle her down in this age. Okay? Ephesians 3.21, we looked at that earlier in, in, in the book of Ephesians. Matthew 28, 18-20. He, uh, he, he, he was talking to his ecclesia there again. And he said, after you've been cast out into the world, having been cast out into the world, all right, make disciples. So many things, King James it says, uh, go ye therefore and make disciples. But that's not what it says. After you've been thrown out into the world, prophetically, <coughs> Jesus was talking about what would happen to his little church. Okay? This ecclesia. Now, the church already had baptism. It already had the Lord. It already had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit isn't everybody that's saved. But the Shekinah glory of God came upon the church on the day of Pentecost the Shekinah glory of God, and immersed that church. We had two examples of that in the Old Testament, didn't we? When the Shekinah glory of God came upon an assembly. Where, what, where were those two, two examples that we have? Number one, the tabernacle. the tabernacle of God. The tabernacle was completely finished. It was all together. It was erected. It was there. All right, The Lord's church was already called out in His ministry. It was established. It had baptized people. It had uh, converted people. They had cast out demons. They had a treasurer. Had apostles. What was the first gift placed in the church? Apostles. All right. It already had apostles in it. And he told the church to meet him there in Jerusalem until they received power from all high. God told Moses to go there and pick out men and make this tabernacle exactly like I have shown you, and he was going to inspire the workers even to do it. So that was all finished. It was there. They were waiting for the presence of God, the parousia of God, it was going to come down, and he was going to, this kind of glory of God, was going to immerse and control and guide that tabernacle, and the people right there, God was going to dwell with his people who were tabernacle. In John 1, 14, what does it say there, Brother David? John 1 14. Jehoiakim, it says, Kahologo uh, Sarksagenito. And the word flesh he became. And what did he do? He tabernacled among his people. All right? So back in the Old Testament, that was a type of what God was going to do in the New Testament, wasn't it? All right? So here we have the tabernacle. 
And then we have Solomon come on the scene. Of course, David gathered up all the material and everything. He wanted to build a house for God. And Solomon built the temple of God. He built the temple of God. And then they had the de dedication for that temple. Now, the temple was already built. Right? They were waiting there for God to come and take possession of this of this temple that they had built. So what happened on the dedication day of the temple after the temple was already built? God immersed it with His Shekinah presence, His Shekinah glory, and they could hardly minister for the presence and the glory of God. So the Lord, starting in the early Gospels, called out His little assembly his mathetes, his disciples. And that's very beautiful. One. It's very beautiful because, you know, the great Bible teachers, the great rabbis of old, they heard about Jesus, the great rabbi. What does the word rabbi mean? Teacher. Teacher. Well, no, it means more than that. What does the word rabbi mean? Huh? What? Doctor. It means doctor of theology. <clears throat> Someone that has drunk well at the springs of the, of the water of life. They have become a master teacher. The word master means doctor in so many times. So he was a doctor. He was a, 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 theo, a theologian. A great theologian. That's what a rabbi was. He was a great theologian. Brother Harold. Rabboni then is the name for someone who is a rabbi. He is. He, 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 he would just put doctor. Okay. Yeah. You know? And and you'll you'll see this with my my students that are doctors. Almost always they will address me, Doctor Phillips. And it is they're doing that in in respect because they know what it takes to get there. <laughs> it takes a lot. But when Jesus, when they when they addressed Jesus, they called him doctor. That's what they did. They called him doctor. Now, if a rabbi saw a student that was very special, he could say, what would he say to him? In the Old Testament times, come and follow me. Come and follow me. And then they would learn at his feet. All right? Paul said he learned at the feet of a great theologian, didn't he? great doctor. Oh, remember that? He learned at the feet. The yeah, Greeks used that same, uh, same uh, motif. What? The Greeks used that yes, same it is. Yeah. The philosophers and everything. They accused Paul of being a philosopher also. Mm -hmm. But uh, now we have Jesus, the great rabbi. And he calls out his little assembly. He started, calls out these disciples. What does the word mathetes mean? What does it mean? Make disciples. That's the command in Matthew 28, 18. Make disciples. Make habitual learners. And you have to teach them. It's that teaching them, and it comes from the word didaskalos. It means to teach them doctrines. Teach them doctrines. All right? Teach them doctrines. Now, why today, as God's churches have come down through the ages, and we see the history of them so beautifully, Making it down through the ages, sometimes they were in darkness, sometimes they, they were out in the open. And we see the great monster Catholicism there, killing and destroying. Uh, they, you know, they didn't even want to read the book of Revelation because they interpreted, so many people interpreted the book of Revelation as a great harlot there as the Catholic Church at that time. And I'm telling you, you know what? You read it and you study the dark ages, and she was a type of the great harlot to come in the last days. That's exactly what it's going to be like again. Well, <clears throat> the Lord prepares his bride for himself by what? Washing her in the Word. Now, I said a while ago, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of people in heaven, but there won't be one person in the bride without baptism. Because now that is important. <clears throat> There's, that's that's a very important thing. Baptism is extremely important. We don't make enough of it sometimes. 
It says in the Word of God that many shall be ashamed at His coming. Do you think that you can look forward to coming to Christ without being baptized? Would that be analogous to Adam and Eve meeting God after their sin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you when you're bat what, what do you do when you're baptized? Huh? You put Christ. You clothe on Christ, don't you? You tie on. You bind on Christ. Out in the world, you just do like the world. Everybody, you look like the world, don't you? You smell like the world. Everybody, act like the world. Talk like the world. <laughs> but when you are saved, the first command that God has for a child of God is what? Baptism. Baptism. Baptism is a work of righteousness. And what do you do when you're baptized? When you're baptized? Dip. Hmm? Dip. Well, first of all, you're dipped. There is no other, no such thing as baptism without being immersed. There are three Greek words that refer to this. Nipto. What in the world does nipto mean? Hmm? Oh, no. <laughs> pour. Alright, that means to pour. Now, if, if baptism was pouring something on somebody, they would have used the word nipto. I want you to write this down now. This is very important. Nipto. Now, I better write it. Probably can do better in yeah. my Greek anyway. Nipto. All right. Now, Ron Tizo. Sprinkle. This is a. Uh, I don't know how to do it in English. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. But it's got a rough breather on the front of it. That's why it's really hard. Haran, you breathe. Haran. See that rough breather? Haran Tizo. Haran Tizo means to sprinkle. Now, there's Greek words for this. These are Greek words. You can look them up in any Greek lexicon. Okay? Especially Liddell and Scott, because that's profane and biblical Greek both. Nipto is to pour. Ron is to sprinkle. Okay? Now, Baptizo, that means to dip or immerse. It comes from the Latin word. Our word immerse comes from the Latin word mergio. All right? It means to dip. Now, in the Bible, when King James came to the word Baptizo, what was the Catholic Church, I mean the Church of England doing at that time? They were dipping, they were sprinkling. Huh? They, they were sprinkling. sprinkling. He said, if you baptize that word, if you change, if you translate that word correctly, I'm going to kill you. Because the Catholic, uh, the, not the Catholic, the Church of England did not dip for baptism. So said, what are we going to do? So they had a big council. What are we going to do? They did it over two words especially. One of them was church. Ecclesia, and they decided that they going to do that church instead of assembly. Okay, if they had done an assembly, they'd have known that the Baptists were right. They just sure didn't want to make sure that they didn't want to concede anything to the Baptists. But also, the Baptists were dipping. So when they came to this word baptizo, they said, "Well, don't translate it. Just bring it over in English and leave it cloaked in mystery." All right. Baptism means to dip. What do you do when you when you're baptized? You die to your former life. You're laid down to your former life. You die. We're buried with Christ in baptism, and we're raised what? In newness of life. Because now you have put on Christ officially and publicly. You are a child of God, and I am going to make my public profession of it right now. That's when you become eligible for the bride. <laughs> and the church. Jim, what, All right? yes. what uh, text in the Bible uses uh, baptized, translates it correctly? Or two places. It's translated correctly. I can't tell you the exact verses, but I'll tell you where they are. One of them where Judas dipped his hand in the dish with Jesus. Were dipped. It's translated correctly there. And another is where the lamb had his vesture dipped in blood. Okay. Sister Andino, you had a question. No, I was going to say that 
In Spanish, it's raptizo for sprinkler, almost the same language. Oh, right, like raptizo? Raptizo. Raptizo. And baptizo. Baptizo is, mm -hmm. is the dip. Dip. Okay. All right. Uh, now, yes. the Douay version, the Catholic English version, uh -huh. do they use baptize there also? Do you know? I've got it at home. I haven't looked at it lately. If I don't look at something within the last six months, I forget it. <laughs> Used to, I could remember it for 40 years, but not anymore. I have to re rejuvenate it all. I wouldn't be surprised if it would read baptism. It probably is baptized, because they don't want them to know. They want it to be as a rite. Now, let me tell you a little something else. I'll throw another secret at you here. This is something, when you read most of the Greek lexicons, Look who wrote it. That's very important. If a pedo Baptist wrote that, what's a pedo Baptist? A baby baptizer. They're going to call the word bat, baptizo, and there's a root form of it. Bapto, okay. They're going to say that that is a right. It is a right. Why would they say that? Because they don't want to say what they believe is wrong, <laughs> so they're going to call it. A, they're going to call it a ceremony. Okay. Now, in the Catholic Church, there are seven sacraments, aren't there? Yeah. All right. And baptism is one of those sacraments. What is a sacrament? It's something that makes you holy or worthy of heaven. Baptism does not make you worthy of heaven is not a sacrament but it is a it is an ordinance there are two ordinances in the in the New Testament baptism is one and Lord's Supper is the other neither one of them save you but I guarantee you without it, baptism you will be ashamed when you come before God without physical baptism physical baptism yes I don't understand that Physical baptism? I don't understand why you would be ashamed when you come before God without physical baptism. Well, you did not obey God. What if, it's not, what if you have a deathbed conversion and you are not capable of being baptized? Well, then that's, that's, that's <coughs> different. The, the thief on the cross he wasn't was never part of the New Testament church, but he was no. going to be in paradise with God. He was never baptized, I guarantee you. But if he'd have been saved the week before that and he had offered opportunity to be baptized by that little church he would have been ashamed when he come before God because the first work of righteousness you can do is baptism and it's obedience it's obedience yes what church did the Ethiopian eunuch join well he was I'm sure that it was sent out from the Jerusalem church because the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized by a deacon wasn't he and that deacon was probably part of the Jerusalem church or a church that had been established from that. And deacons and pastors do baptize. We find that from the New Testament. Deacons and, and pastors. Let's go on this verse a little bit further now. Now you're to preach the word of God that he might present to himself he might present to himself that's the word alto and he ought to, in glory, clothed in glory, or glorious, the what? Church. Assembly. assembly. All right, the assembly. All right. And this assembly is the one, this one we call the glorious church. There was a book written on this one verse right here, glorious church, Roy M. Reed. Roy M. Reed. Yeah, Roy M. Reed wrote, wrote a whole book on this verse right here, the glorious beautiful church. Beautiful hymn on this, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the hymn, brother? Tis the glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed right. in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> That's good, brother. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that he might present to himself the glorious, the glorious assembly. The glorious assembly. Not having... Spilon, spot, or, look at that little correlative there, that or, eh. Retida, wrinkle. Spot or wrinkle. What does a bride like to do? 
when she's going to her wedding. Everything perfect. Everything's got to be perfect, ironed all out, starched, and all that kind of Man, stuff. Done just so hair. Yes, absolutely. Everything's got to be perfect because this is the this is the day that she presents herself to her Lord, her husband. Beautiful. They say a woman on her wedding day is the most beautiful that she'll ever be because she takes a lot of time to get that way. <laughs> present herself beautiful. Now, shouldn't the God's bride do that also? Wrinkle or t any of the such things. Or any such things. But, in order that, she might be hagia. Hagia. Again, what is the first work of righteousness that a person, a child of God, can do? Baptism. Holy and amomos. Unspotted. Unspotted. 528. Hutos. O Philusen. O Hi. Hi. Hoi. Hoi. Andres. Agapon. Agapon. Tas. Yaton. Ganekos. Hos. Ta. Yaton. Somata. Ho. Agapon. Tain. Yaton. Ganeka. Yaton. Agapa. Boy, there's a lot of love in this verse, isn't there? A lot of love. We have two. In or thusly or in this same manner. It is necessary, O Philo, it is very necessary, also the husbands. Then we have an infinity, present infinity of active agapon. The husbands to love. This means to sacrifice yourself. Husbands uh, are to protect their wives, aren't they? That's, that wives expect that from their husbands, don't you? I remember one of the first things that my my wife, she says, uh, "Will you protect me?" I thought so. Definitely, I'll protect you. Yes, I'll protect you. She was worried whether I'd protect her or not. I said, sure, I'll protect you. I'll care for you and protect you. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Have I done that? Yeah, supposed to. Protect your wives. He, uh, it is necessary also the husbands to love. That's love to the point of giving your life for the, of themselves, wives. Good in that case. In like manner, the themselves bodies, the one loving the himself, why he himself he loves. Do you like yourself? Do you like to have a lot of pain? I don't like pain. Mm -hmm. oh. Do you anybody go out and just Smash your toe today on purpose. <laughs> so you could limp around the rest of the day and be in pain all day long. Anybody go out there and fall out the, the back door and bump your head and, and think that's the normal thing to do? Yeah, but I have a lot of things I don't like what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we as children of God, we are very satisfied with our minds and our actions sometimes. Because we love God. Okay? But... We're using a physical analogy here to explain something that's very spiritual. This is a parable, so to speak, an analogy. A person normally likes to feed your body, don't you? When you're hungry. How about when you're thirsty? You like to give it a drink? All right. You don't like to get too thirsty, do you? You want to get a drink before you get that 
your tongue swells up and your and your lips all crack and everything else. But you know, sometimes husbands treat their wives poorly. And they treat themselves spiritually poorly. How about, you know, we go to church once, two, three times a week. How would you like to only eat that many times a week? Hmm? Well, you know, at home you can get your word, the Word of God, and you can feed yourself with that too. This isn't the place you talk about fasting. No, no, this isn't the place you talk about fasting. Okay. That's, fasting is when you get your body under control. Okay, but we're using a uh, the Lord through Paul is using the idea here is that we try to take good care of our bodies because we like them a whole lot, and when we and when we uh, when we're hurting, we don't feel very well. If you don't get enough sleep, how do you feel? Crummy. Crummy. If you don't get enough to eat, what do you feel? Hungry. Some people like grizzly bears, you know. Feed me or I'll kill somebody. <laughs> well, we feed ourselves and take care of ourselves and close our... When we're cold, we want to put something on to keep warm. Now, the Lord says, husbands, the way you take care of your own bodies, that is your wife. Christ loves his assembly. That's why he, we have church services. So we can preach to the assembly, to the, to the bride of Christ, that she might present herself to God without spot or wrinkle or anything. How do we know what's right? Well, we got an instruction manual right here. We got the instruction manual. <coughs> this is it. 529. Who days? Gar. Pote. Tain. Yautu. Sarkov. Emesse. Sen. Allah. Ek trefo. Trefe, that is. Kai. Thalete. Altain. Kathos, Kai, Ho, Christos, Tain, Ecclesion. Look at how many, look at how many times that the Lord keeps using this word Ecclesia here in this book. For no one ever the himself flesh he hated. Now we get discouraged with our flesh, don't we? It we do. We in all reality, it's not the flesh we hate so much, the sarks, but the mind of the flesh. Hmm. The mind of the flesh that we hate so much. Never anyone, the flesh of himself, he hated. But he tenderly nourishes it. Ek trefo. He tenderly nourishes it. And cherishes. This is another word for love, this thought pay. Thought to. Okay? Thought to. This is another word. This this is the word that means to cherish and to care for it. Just as also the Christ, Ho Christos Tain Ecclesion. As Christ loved his assembly. In the eternal ages to come, that assembly is going to be real juxtaposition close to the Lord forever, isn't she? There's going to be a lot of servants in heaven. There's going to be a lot of, of, a, of the great assemblies around him. But that bride is going to be doing what with him? Ruling and reigning with him. Ruling and reigning with him. How long? Age Tony on Tony on. Ages upon the ages upon the ages upon the ages. That's how long. Now she's important to him. For no one himself, no one ever, of himself the flesh he hated. That word, look at that word, emesis. 
That comes from Messio. You don't hate your flesh. You hate the mind of your flesh if you're a child of God. And if you're a lost man, you're just relishing it and you're just rolling in it like a hog in, in the mud pile. But it's not doing you any good. Where's the old man take you? Downhill. Downhill to the flaming pits of fire of hell. Your new spirit in you leads you toward God. And over him flesh he hated, but he tendensively nourishes and cherishes it, just as also Christ the church. 5 and verse 30. Hote. Mele. Esmen. Two. Somatos. Now, two. Now, there's a lot of cross references to all this. I didn't give them all to you. In the 5.27 was 2 Corinthians 4.14 and 11 and 2, Colossians 1.22, Ephesians 1 and 4. And 5.28 was Ephesians 5.22 and 23, 1 Peter 3 and 7, Genesis 2, 21 through 25. And 29, and then we have 30. 1 Corinthians 6.15 and 12.27, Ephesians 1 and 23. These cross references are really important. Even the second chapter of the book of Genesis. Go there. This is very important. You have to understand this if you're going to love, see how the man... Now we covered this some, some last week. In Hebrew it is absolutely fantastic. 2 and 7 says, And Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, He uh, constructed man as he constructed the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breathings of lives and man became a living nephish soul. That's Genesis 2 and 7. Okay? God created man from the same elements that he created the dust of the ground. He created man because he... How did God create him? He created him in his what? Own image. His own image. Okay? Now he didn't make him... Now, I've used this term before, but this pulpit here is made out of wood. Okay? Now, it is a pulpit now, but before it was a pulpit, it was wood. Now, before man was man, he was not dust. He's not a secondary creation of God. He's a primary creation of God. You can only see this in Hebrew. These are some things that you've got to bring out to understand the love and the... Uh, volition that God had in creating mankind. He didn't create him from dirt, but he created him from the same elements that he created the dirt from. Now, he created him prophetically to become dust. You'll see this in different places. But if you read this, as you read it, the different translations, he created him as he created the dust, but to become dust. Why? Because he would fall, and he would become dust. He would go to the ground, he would die, he would disintegrate and turn into dust. Brother Harold. What can I change this word dust in my translation of seven, 2 and 7? Okay. This, now, listen real close. Then Jehovah Elohim, he formed, fashioned man as the dust of the ground. As he fashioned the dust. Where did the dust come from? God. Come from God. Where did the cosmos come from? Come from God. Everything came from God now, okay? And man is a primary creation of God. Now this he says, came from him. This says just from the ground. Okay, as the ground. Okay. As the dust of the ground. As the man was the dust. a fiat creation. He, yes. He is a primary creation of God. He is directly from the hands and the person of God. Not made from something but he came from God himself. Primary. And uh, then we find out that God put man in the garden, the till the garden. And uh, he told him not to eat from the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right? And then in verse 18 it says, And Jehovah Elohim said, It's not good for the man to be alone, so I'll make for him a helper Worthy of him. Worthy of him. I'll make a helper worthy of him. 
Remember this, husbands. This is very important. I'll make a help, uh, uh, him a helper worthy of him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Who was made from the ground? Who was made from the dust? The animals. The animals. But not man. And the, the translators of King James threw it such a curve to the world when they translated that that yes. it's got man, God created man like he created animals. He didn't create animals like he created man. He created animals from the dust of the ground. Out of the ground. But he created man as he created the dust of the ground. There's a difference there now. I mean a big difference. Now is, is Ecclesiastes 12... Where it says, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was in the spirit shall return unto God. Yeah. Is that correct? It is correct. But it, see, man became dirt, didn't he? When did he become dirt? When he sinned. When he sinned, yes. And it's a very beautiful thing also. Because then man is related to the dirt, isn't he? So God, when he became flesh, he also became related to his creation so he could redeem the creation itself back. Alright? What did Jesus eat all the time he was on this earth? Everything he ate came from the earth, didn't it? Alright? Now Jesus never disintegrated. He would have never, even as he gave his life up, he wasn't killed, he gave up his spirit. He would have never rotted in the grave. His blood never rotted. I don't think any of it went on the ground. I don't think they ever found any of everything. I think every bit of that blood was taken to the Holy of Holies in heaven. It says that God uh, gave names to all, or man gave names to all of the cattle and birds of the sky and every beast. Verse 21 in the second chapter. Then the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, caused a deep sleep to fall upon man, and he slept, and he took... Took what? He took of his sides. Plural. Sides. He took from his sides and closed up the fleshes in the place of her. Beautiful in Hebrew. He took from his sides and he closed up the flesh in the place of her. Now, woman is not the primary creation of God. She's what? Amen. She's out of man, Isha. Ish is man, Isha is woman. Woman means out of man in almost every language as far as I know. Out of man. See how closely related to man she is? Do the Jews teach no. this? Or do they, do they teach sides? Do they teach ribs? Or? Well, I haven't studied it in a long time. But they teach, in the original Hebrews, one of my teachers was taught by the rabbis. I wish Jerry was here. Yeah. Remember Jerry? I was mm -hmm. just thinking about that. Because <laughs> he, was, he was really good at this, and he could go back in the cabal and all of this and, and look at all the traditions and everything. But it says, God, the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, fashioned into a, out of man the sides from which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. She was part of him, wasn't she? Now, I'm going to tell you something, man. That woman that you're hooked up with there is part of you. She's an integral part of you, just like of your own flesh and blood. That's right. That's where she came from. There's only one Adam and one Eve in this world. But there's been a lot of Adam and Eve since then. A lot of women and men that started families. And they created their children and brought them forth. Because they became one flesh and they brought forth children. Now, when, when, uh, let, me, let me finish, brother. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't keep my mind like I used to. Now, when God created Adam, every person that would ever live... He breathed into Adam the breathings of lives. Your life was there. Your spark of life was in Adam at that time. When he took when he took woman out of him, 
He took part of that man, didn't he? He took woman out of it. I know this is really, sometimes, you know, 20 years from now, you may under, might understand this better than you do right now. Okay? There's a time element in learning. I'm telling you that is absolute fact. I've been teaching this for a long time. My type teachers taught it to me. And they used to teach me. Brother Farrar would sit there and Brother, Brother Hubbard. And they would try to teach me what I'm trying to teach you today. And they say, now listen closely. You may not understand this now, but 20 years from now, you will understand it better than you ever have. And it is glorious how God created man from himself. And then he took from man, he created woman. Man, woman came from man like God, like man came from God. Do you understand? Do you, do you see how close they are? It is so close. God never meant for man to, to, to get away from him. He created him to be a recipient of his love. Now husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church because she is actually part of you. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's beautiful. Brother Wally, now. Oh. One of these. One of these rascals. Now see, it's a little hard. <laughs> uh, one of these guys had more than one wife. How did God look at that? Yeah. He says he never he never planned it such. But for the hardness of their hearts, the wickedness of their heart, he allowed it. He allowed it. It wasn't what God planned. It's one woman and one man. Okay? That's the way God planned it. Because it was a type of Christ and his church. Okay? So is there is there a reference? to the wick wickedness of their hearts that he allowed that? Yes. What it, what That's what it? Christ said. What? He literally said that. I can't remember the place in the New Testament, brother. But they ask him. He said, well, why did he do this? He said, because of the wickedness of because their hearts. Because that's a commonly asked yeah. question yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. That's what it uh, uh, Even good old Abraham, uh, Sarah was his primary wife. And well, that, well, that, let's look, look at Abraham's that, life now. And what... what he had Keturah after Sarah died. Yes. And then even... Uh, he had a lot more children. Now what did that cause? That Agar. What happened to that? Well, what what all did all... Here we have the child of faith, which was Isaac. Okay. We have Isaac. Then we have Ishmael. Then we have all of those other tribes, the twelve tribes. The and they're all princes. still fighting. And what are they doing? Every one of them are trying to kill the son of faith. Just look at the over there right now. Every one of the Palestinians. Israel opened up and let them have these lands and stuff after they won it with their sweat and blood. And what do they want to do to Israel? Kill them. Kill them. They're taking up space. Breathing up air. Kill them. Till down to the last man. One, one, one fellow even went and said, uh, Haman, Herod, yeah, and uh, Yasser Arafat, all the same bunch. Yeah. Let's go on a little bit. I have one more question. Yes, brother. You mentioned breath, breathe in the breath. Breathings of, of lives. lives. Breathings plural. plural. Breathings plural of lives plural. It says singular here. I draw them, brother. Okay. My brother. <laughs> it says like Hashemayim is not singular. It is plural. Heavens. God created the heavens plural. And the earth singular. Okay? All right. In, in, in Hebrew and in Greek, it makes a world of difference what God said. He inspired it in Hebrew and Greek. He didn't inspire it in English. We have to explain it in English. What? And we have to fight all the other translations that have been made to do it. <laughs> what, what verse does that pertain to? The breathings of life? Uh, 2 and 7, I believe. Two and seven. Seven. Oh, read that okay. for me, 2 and 7. Did you ever hear anybody teach this, Sister Anne? No. Is, is this it? You have to learn a lot of Hebrew and Greek to do this. And my teachers drove it in me. They drove it like a wedge. They said, you teach it this way. This is it. You understand it. it took me six years with Brother Hubbard in Hebrew. 
Every, every time we came through, we translated the book of Genesis about five times. All through the whole book. And he just dry, he said, this is the most important book in the Bible. This is the book of beginnings. He said, you've got to get this down because if you don't get this down, you'll never understand what I'm trying to teach you or any other teacher in this old school. You've got to get it down. That's the foundation. When you get that foundation down, does it change your whole outlook on Scripture? It changes the very person of God if you go with that way. You do not see the love and you do not see the, the passion that God loved. And you cannot see the passion which you're supposed to love your wives with either, can you? It's beautiful. 5 and 30. Hote, Mele, Esmen, Tu, Somatos, Autu. We already read it. But let's look at it again now. Because members, we are of the body of Him. Why? Where are you from? Your husband. Your husband. That man that you're married to represents Adam. He gives death to all your children. Doesn't he? he as in Adam, we all die. But he represents Adam. As in Adam, we are all also made alive. That husband does what he's supposed to be doing. He brings life into your family. Doesn't he? Because he tells them the spiritual thing is the life. Now, as you look at your husband, and you might, as, as I'm trying, not trying to build the husbands up too much here, because they get big enough heads as it is. And, you, and as Sarah called Abraham, I think that Sarah knew the Genesis 2 and 7. And the whole chapter thereof afterwards, thereafter. And she saw what she was made out of. And she saw the closeness of it. How did Abraham get in trouble? Lying. Hmm? Lying. Well, he lied. But how did he get in trouble? How did he cause all the confusion and all the war? Not trusting God. Not trusting God and listening to his wife. Who was supposed to be the leader in that family? He was supposed to be the leader. Now, what? Whose fault is all the Middle Eastern war today? Ishmael. And Abraham. <laughs> Let's put it where it falls. Brother, and that man is the father of the faithful. And he's your father. For all children of Abraham that have believed. Okay. But we can see the mistakes that God. You know, God wrote down all the mistakes and all the sin too, didn't he? Mm -hmm. There's a reason for it. So we might not follow in their footsteps, in the wrong footsteps. David was after... The Word of God says David was a man after the heart of God. What was the name David mean? The Lord of the Beloved One. He loved God. But it also said he was a murderer and an adulterer. That, now what did that cause David? Pain forever. And his children forever did. Pain. If he had followed the ways of God, what would he have? A lot smoother sailing. Also cost him his building of the Lord's house. That's right. Old McGee says, after he'd done that, he never breathed another breath of happiness in his life. God puts us on a leash, doesn't he? Your children to God. We're not our own anymore. We're on a leash. We really are. We're on a leash. Now, when a, something's on a leash, he's got a little leeway, doesn't he? You ever have walked the dog around and he was on a long leash and he got in trouble? It would have been better if he had been held tied up close. When you're training horses, I've done a lot of horse training in my life. You like what the idea is, is to ride a horse with a loose rein. And that horse, when he's broke and trained, he knows what you want before you can 
even tell him because he feels you move on him. These horses, these uh, <coughs> beautiful white horses, those those little the they're beautiful horses, aren't they? They're trained for years. They train the riders and they train the horses. And they're out there doing all these little things. They're taking cues from the rider. Okay. Now, when you're riding a horse in the show ring, a western horse, you want a real loose rein on it. How many of you ever watch cutting horse shows? I introduced my wife to that. She thought that was a pretty neat thing to go out there. And you just barely touch the horse's rein and you show him which cow you want. And then what do you do with the, with the reins? You, go. you drop the reins down and then he works them there on. And if you pick those reins up, he just goes like this. Hadn't touched his, the bit, hasn't touched his mouth. But he just knows it's there. Now, brethren, if you really want to be happy, let God ride you with a loose rein. It is, it is for your good. Nothing in this world is really good for you that you think is. What, we, what the flesh desires is not good for you. What the Spirit desires is that which gives you eternal life and happiness. Just like, like Abraham. Now, God knew Abraham was going to make all the mistakes that he did. He had a gob of kids. Did you know that? He had a gob of kids after Sarah died. Mess of them. Six kids. Huh? Six. Yeah. A mess of them. A lot of children. They all became princes. But those princes have fought against the child of faith all these years. What if he'd have just stuck with Sarah? Boy, wouldn't things have been so much smoother? Now, just in your own life, how many times have we made those mistakes in our own lives? How many times have we just heaped misery upon ourselves? God doesn't want you to not have fun. It's just our idea of fun, and what fun is, is it's, it's by definition. I'm going to tell you something. The most fun I ever had in this world was usually in church, hearing God's Word. And the joy of my heart was just sometimes I would cry. Songs of the faith, reading God's Word, Explaining God's Word. These verses that are brought to you tonight are just dynamite out of God's Word. They are. To me, I spent my whole life trying to explain these verses because they're so beautiful. I hope I got it across a little bit. And if, if, if you didn't get it all tonight, try to remember, try to write those notes down and maybe ten years from now you'll understand better. But don't give up on them. Keep thinking about it. And as one of my teachers says, think is a good trick if you can do it. Learn to think on your own. Learn to reason in the scriptures. What is the date? 17. Well, that's where we're going to finish for tonight. And I, I hope that I got these great mysteries out into the light where you could understand them just a little better. Because the idea of the church and your wives is very, very important. You're to nourish your wife and love her. Love her like she was your own flesh because where'd she come from in all reality? From you. She is your flesh. She is your blood, Brother Mike. Do you have that Bible you was reading from? Was that the restoration of the Sacred Name Bible? Well, no, I was reading from memory from oh, Hebrew, Brother. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. I was just remembering what it said in Hebrew and bringing it to you. Why don't they have a, a English translation that brings out all this? 
in Genesis. Because there are very few people that understand Hebrew enough to do that. Oh. I've seen some pretty good translations at times. But I, I, I tell you, the what I brought to you tonight comes from a long time ago. Gesenius. You ever heard of Gesenius? He's the one, one of the people that wrote the, the, the Hebrew Greek or the Hebrew English lexicon, Gesenius' lexicon. Uh, A. T. Robertson, John A. Bros, J. R. Graves, G. H. Pember, Bullinger. These people were all contemporaries, and they shared the Hebrew, especially the Hebrew. Hebrew is important. If you don't get it right from Genesis, you're going to miss the ball all the way through. You'll never get in the strike zone. <laughs> It's just that way. Now these are these these were in their heyday in what the twenties? Oh no, this is in the, in the middle of the eighteen hundreds. In the middle to the late eighteen hundreds. Oh, so Robertson, when did he live? A. T. Robertson. He lived all the way up to probably nineteen thirty or something. But John A. Broadus was his father in law. Everything that A. T. Robertson brought to you in print was from John A. Broadus. John A. Broadus was one of the founders of court. Now you have to remember, back at that time all Southern Baptists were missionary Baptists at that time. All of them had the same thing. J.R. J. Graves preached at the Southern Baptist con Convention. He preached, remove not the ancient landmarks. And then that's where the landmark Baptists got their landmark name. All right? They were all back at that period of time. And at that time, there were people that were going into evangelism. And that became the Southern Baptists. And they were all millennialists. And they were going the way away from J.R. Graves and John Brawless and G. H. Pember and a lot of those people back then. It just went away, and they went into just a very watered down. They were preaching evangelism, and that was all. That's all it was. So why don't you uh, deviate from the Greek next uh, after we're done with this and teach us Genesis and Hebrew? Genesis and Hebrew. <laughs> well, <laughs> didn't I tonight? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm throwing it at you. All right. I'm throwing it at you a little bit. Well, well now, where it's, it, 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 was it relevant to, to Ephesians absolutely. tonight? Oh, absolutely. Could you understand the fifth chapter of Ephesians without going back to Genesis? Be honest. No, you can't do it. So when it, when we are there, I'm going to take you back to the book of Genesis. I may even open up Hebrew and start reading Hebrew to you. Well, we're not finished with it yet. But where it relates to it so thoroughly, we have to do that. In the book of uh, Hebrews, you, and in the book of Revelation, which I've taught 96 classes on, we studied Genesis a lot. We had to understand the Hebraism because John's Gospel, the John's writings, we, we studied the Gospel of John. Also, we did the Gospel of John. And we had to study Hebrew because John uses so many Hebraisms. And every time Paul uses a Hebraism or something, we have to go back to Hebrew. And that's exactly what he did tonight. So we understand it. Sister Andina, was that good t t tonight? Was this all right on the vision to find? Yeah. I know you heard a lot of this all, all your life, haven't you? But maybe not in that depth. Because it comes from Hebrew. A lot of times we just hit the surface and paint it up and polish it up real pretty. But get right down there to the, the, to the structure of it. Now you understand the structure of that verse. And you understand the structure of marriage. It's and beautiful. About the glorious church. The glorious church. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's beautiful. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to send you out, turn you loose on the world. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> turn you loose on the world. Brother Harold, would you dismiss us in prayer tonight, brother? Father, thank you for this time of study, and thank you for Brother James knowledge in this presentation to us. Bless us as we go about in this world and help us to use what we've learned tonight to reach other people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, you like this better than fishing? <laughs> I would. Definitely. I like to go fishing now and then, but I'll tell you what.